Services Marketing, NKT 625, Lecture Number 9. Assalamualaikum Khabatino Hazrat. This is Wasim Asan, your instructor for the course Services Marketing MKT 625 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. I welcome you to lecture number nine of the course. We are progressing toward our understanding about customer expectations, which lays the ground for the whole exercise on services marketing. And you have seen that we have developed the blocks by way of understanding that what really are the characteristics of services and what are the classifications of different levels of services. With this understanding, we have been in a position to understand the mixed bag of tools that we have to ourselves in order to come up with the right framework of the marketing and associated strategies. We have learned that there are certain gaps which present themselves while the customer goes through the process of evaluation. And we know that those gaps occur because of the differences between customer expectations and management perceptions and um, between the management perceptions and the standards they specify to the sell the services and between the standards and uh, delivery of the service. And then there is uh, the fourth level of gap which exists between the delivery of the service and communication. We have um, very uh, convincingly looked into the reasons why you know, these gaps occur and now we are trying to understand as to how we really can close those gaps. And we have developed the understanding by now that uh, before we start understanding as to how to close those gaps, we have to uh, learn the different phases of the process of evaluation through which a customer goes while he or she evaluates one certain service. And I would like to draw your attention toward the continuum of uh, evaluation, which I was talking about toward the end of the last lecture. You will realize that uh, the services uh, or different marketing goods are divided into three different parts which are characterized by search qualities, experience qualities, and credence qualities. And you also know the more you are toward the left of the continuum, you have an ease of evaluating different goods that are there on the market for sale. As you move along the continuum, uh, you, you know that tangibility starts giving in favor of intangibility and by the time you are at the far right end of the continuum, you are dealing with uh, services which uh, are very rich in experience and credence, which means that uh, you cannot really evaluate those services uh, after quite a bit of time that you have bought those services because you are not in a position to understand the technical aspects and you have to wait for some time before you start realizing that the service rendered was okay. And therefore, the difficulty of evaluating such services presents itself. So the continuum is all about evaluation. On the left-hand side of the continuum, you have products which are easy to evaluate, whereas you have products, service products on the right end of the continuum which are difficult to evaluate and in between you have seen an overlap and those are the services which are kind of hybrid services where service element as well as the tangible side of the product are equally important like for example restaurants food is as much important as the service and vice versa now with this understanding we also have understood the crux the crux is that we've got to understand that a customer goes through the process of evaluation as he goes by the continuum. Now, customer does not deliberately go by the continuum the way that you and I understand that. This is something which is happening in the customer's mind, and we as marketing managers must understand and appreciate how that process takes place and what are the factors and elements that uh, a customer uh, that takes into consideration before he starts making up you know, his or her mind for buying one particular service. And therefore, uh, we have to understand those phases which are involved in that process. Well, we must know that uh, there are three different phases through which a customer passes uh, before he evaluates a product, 
um, while he buys a product and after he has bought that product. And I'm referring to service products. The pre-purchase phase is a very important phase because it is the most, most preliminary phase. This is where a customer starts with building up his mind about whether or not to buy a particular service. Now, what are the factors which really flash into his mind before he uh, makes up his mind to buy that particular service? Well, uh, different factors. The one is the internal factors, and uh, internal factors uh, have a lot of influence on customers' the decision uh, for buying or for not buying a particular service. And internal factors um, are representative of uh, the personal experiences. I think the personal experiences uh, they present themselves as the most important element of or the factor of um, internal things. Because if you have had a good experience, meaning a positive experience with uh, a particular service, you are all set to buy that service all over again. And in case your experience uh, with that service has not been positive, then there's no way that you're going to buy that service again. So the personal experiences uh, are very important, and uh, the job of the marketing people is to see to it that uh, while they deliver the service, everything goes fine because that is where uh, the customer uh, builds up um, his you know, final, final expectations about the quality level of the service. And this is something which I'm going to talk about in the next phase, which is about encounters. Coming back to internal factors, uh, these could be the experiences, which I just talked about, and these also could be uh, the word of mouth and referrals. People give a lot of weight to uh, the opinions of their near and dear. And therefore, uh, those expressions uh, and opinions really weigh in uh, to the scale, um, either to the favor of the service product or to its disfavor. They will weigh in uh, to the favor of the service product if uh, the others also have had a positive experience. In case others also have had a negative experience, there's no way that the process is going to go further on. It will just cease there, and uh, there's no way that uh, the customer is going to get into the subsequent phases of uh, the evaluation. Other um, elements of uh, the, you know, this factor are uh, promotions and uh, the word of mouth. Well, word of mouth is very much similar to referrals. And uh, the promotions are the ones to which you as a customer are exposed. If um, a customer is well exposed to different kinds of promotions, then promotions do have an impact on the thought process of the customer who will, in all probability, make up his mind to buy that particular service he is considering to buy. The other factors are uh, external factors. External factors are uh, basically uh, representative of uh, the very persuasive nature of uh, sales activities on part of the uh, salespeople from different companies. Now, this automatically means that uh, external factors refer to the availability or rather wide availability of services by different um, competitors. And it is this availability of um, services and the exposure of customers to these uh, services that uh, these factors uh, become important because they do have an impact on the thought process of the customer. These uh, could be uh, like pricing uh, and uh, the promotions. Uh, the pricing and promotions uh, have a uh, very strong kind of impact on um, uh, the customer if the uh, service product is considered positively. Now, let me add here, if you have had a good experience with uh, a service in the past and the external factors uh, also are in favor of that particular service because the pricing is very attractive and the promotions that they are carrying out are very impactful and uh, the experience that you've had uh, is positive, then all these factors uh, put together do have uh, the kind of a very positive impact on you to go for um, that particular service. Apart from uh, the pricing and uh, the promotions, uh, there's another uh, element of this factor uh, which uh, may affect your uh, thought process, and that is the uh, social um, side of it. Uh, 
the societal uh, pressures. Uh, to give you one example, uh, you know, when a customer makes a decision between either going to a fast food restaurant for a quick lunch or going to uh, a fine restaurant where he or she wants to entertain and oblige uh, a business associate, uh, the social pressures are playing the role into you know, these kind of equations. In the case of the former, where uh, a customer might like to go to a fast food chain uh, for a quick lunch, uh, it emanates basically from one particular basic need that the customer just wants to uh, fill himself up. And in the, in the latter case, uh, where uh, the customer might like to go to a fine restaurant uh, to oblige a business associate, again, a very different kind of societal pressure, so to say, is at work, and uh, therefore two different uh, decisions by the customer. Now, let me, let me rub in the need for you as marketing people to realize and appreciate uh, all these factors because you are to come up with uh, a set of compatible strategies and technical moves in order to make sure that while a customer is going through this evaluation process, before a purchase is made, he is still thinking whether or not to buy this particular product. You have to understand as to how to cash in on this particular opportunity and make it easy for the customer to uh, evaluate your service. And uh, you can do that only by lessening different risks which the customer might perceive uh, while he's going through this particular phase. Let us now talk about uh, another element of uh, this uh, external factor, which is uh, distribution. Well, a very important element because uh, the distribution basically establishes proximity. So in other words, if you know that a service is freely available, they have a lot of outlets. A bank, for example, you can take the example of uh, automatic teller machines. The availability of ATMs uh, at every nook and cranny of your neighborhood is going to make things easy for you uh, when it comes to evaluating that particular service. And uh, the chances are you would like to go to that particular bank, which is uh, offering not only ATMs, but also flexibility of uh, working hours. So if uh, you're also offered uh, that flexibility in terms of their uh, the operations, then um, there are very strong chances that uh, you are going to make a decision in favor of that uh, particular bank. Same is the case with uh, the courier services and uh, fast food restaurants and so on and so forth. If you set your juices flowing, you will agree with me that uh, this holds true for different kinds of services which are distribution oriented. And let's not forget that uh, all the services um, mostly, all the services are distribution oriented, with the exception of uh, the very uh, highly sophisticated uh, the medical diagnostics and scientific research, where we they do not really talk about distribution. But in most of the cases, uh, distribution uh, really presents itself uh, as a very important element of the external uh, the factors uh, that affect the thought process of uh, a typical customer. Uh, another uh, factor which is uh, very weighty and uh, really affects uh, the customer's evaluation, uh, don't forget we are talking about the phase which is the, which is the pre-purchase and we have not, I mean the customer has not yet made up his mind to buy a particular service. So let us take a look at these factors. These are known as the perceived risks. Uh, what are the perceived risks before a customer makes up his mind to buy a particular service could be like performance risk, financial risk, time loss risk, opportunity risk, psychological risk, social risk, physical risk. This list of risks is not absolute and conclusive. It could be even longer, but all I'm saying is that these are the risks which in most of the cases offer stumbling blocks before the final decision by the customer can be made and uh, he proceeds uh, for buying uh, that particular service. Let us talk about these risks one by one in order to have a clear understanding as to how these can become the stumbling blocks. Performance risk. 
Now, this risk is uh, all about uh, is a risk which does not perform. And um, for, the, for the sheer reason the service is going to be bought, uh, is not going to be fulfilled. And uh, therefore, the customer might not decide in favor of that service. Let's take the example of a catering service that, uh, with a sense of pride, claims its specialization in offering, delivering at your doorsteps uh, Chinese food and then fails to deliver, you know, which is not typically Chinese in looks and in taste profile and so on and so forth. And therefore, uh, there's a risk involved whether these people are going to uh, really offer you Chinese food or uh, there's some um, very ingenious adaptation of uh, the actual Chinese food. So the risk really keeps you from making the decision to place the order. Another example could be of a contractor who's pursuing a certain project and uh, really uh, following you for the signing up that contract and then is not in a position to deliver the project on time. Uh, so therefore, there's a performance risk that the contractor may not be able to perform. Why the customer might think so in this particular situation it could be a combination and function of so many different factors which are beside the point here. But um, the, the, the primary point is that uh, it is the performance which has to be perceived by a typical customer um, of uh, being first class if he decides to go for that service. The other risk that I mentioned uh, is a financial risk. Now, financial risk is uh, the monetary loss which a customer uh, might incur as a result of uh, the certain level of inefficiency on part of the seller. The service provider uh, may not be in a position to offer you the service uh, well in time. According to the specifications, uh, the service is uh, designed and uh, therefore it might lead you as to incur loss. Now, this example can fit into a B2B situation, and uh, let me give you an example. In present days, uh, the modern world, the element of supply chain has uh, taken on some very important dimensions and proportions. Just uh, think of um, a buyer who is sitting somewhere else in the world, uh, dealing with uh, a supplier in your country, and uh, the supply chain taking place uh, between uh, your country and the country of uh, our destination uh, where the products are to go. Just look at the service part which is involved here. The buyer uh, places the order, the order is executed, but only because of certain inefficiencies on part of the logistics company, the shipment of goods does not reach its destination on time because the service company that was not in a position to put together all the details very efficiently and effectively about land and sea transportation. So what has happened is that by the time the goods reached there, the buyer there was late in offering those goods to his market. And because of the belated actions of distribution of those products in that particular market, the buyer is prone to the certain losses and certain monetary losses. And uh, you can well imagine the implications of this kind of a situation. This is one example. And you can uh, conjure up you know, certain more examples in your mind uh, when it comes to the customer thinking about a financial risk. Time loss risk. It could be an extension of uh, the financial risk, and uh, I would uh, draw your attention back to the same example of the supply chain, the international supply chain. Because of the inefficiency uh, or certain mistakes which the service provider uh, in the country of origin, where the shipment originated, uh, the shipment got delayed, and there was a certain level of inactivity or belated activities on part of the buyer. In other words, the buyer has lost time. And because of the loss of that time, there has been a certain level of inactivity or belated activities because there's nothing that the buyer could do. He could only wait for the shipment to come. And it is because of that particular reason that many international big buyers could have taken this thing into their hands. Uh, relating authorization of appointment of uh, these kind of logistics companies that uh, offer a very vital service and an extremely sensitive link between the chain of supplies, uh, between the buyer and the seller.
So this is, uh, I would say, a classic example of uh, the time loss risk. You as a service seller have got to see to it that your service is rendered in a way that the buyer of your service does not run into this kind of a situation where he loses time and time is money. Because he loses time, he cannot proceed with the envisaged plans and that affects the whole apple cart. The other risk is known as the opportunity risk. Now, this risk presents itself when a customer opts out of one opportunity in favor of another. Let us take the example of a customer who has opted out of the air travel and has decided to go by train and then not finding the train service up to his expectations and thereby regretting his decision later uh, about not cashing in on the opportunity of the air travel. And uh, if the uh, air company also offers certain uh, pricing and promotional uh, supports, then uh, all the more reason that uh, the customer should have uh, traveled by air. And uh, this takes us back to the concept of uh, creating an equilibrium uh, between different levels of demand in relation to different periods. Um, this airline could be a smart airline that is trying to you know, uh, develop that equilibrium between supply and demand, meaning between capacity and uh, demand. And uh, it is going through a lean period, and it is uh, during that period that this customer uh, opts out of that opportunity and goes for the train uh, transportation and then later regrets. So this risk is uh, all about that, and uh, it is again upon the marketing people to think, rather to, to put on the thinking cap of the customer and then see uh, what kind of a strategic and tactical framework the marketing person can come up in order to lessen this kind of a risk, in order to keep the customer from uh, having two minds in order to keep the customer from thinking about any alternative, he must not think of um, an alternative, uh, the mode of transportation, which is a different kind of industry, all the very closely related. He must stick to your brand. And that is the essence of uh, this concept, that um, you as marketing people have got to understand this particular risk or all the risks that I've talked about, and then be able to decide for yourself which could be the mixed bag of those variables which I talked about in the previous lecture um, that could be smartly applied in this particular situation to keep customers from going elsewhere and keeping them into your own fold. So that's where the smartness of marketing people lies. Let us talk about uh, the next level of uh, risk, which is the psychological risk. Well, this is a risk which uh, makes it difficult for a person to uh, to make sure that uh, whatever he's getting uh, really fits into his self-concept, so to say. It is uh, very psychological in nature, and uh, whatever he's buying it must fit into the self-concept of that person. And let me take you back to the example of uh, a beautician, the example which I talked about in some other reference. Uh, when I was talking about uh, adjusting demand between different periods, you will recall. But here, let's talk in the... Uh, in the context of uh, the risk. Think of a bride who's absolutely frustrated because the beautician has not been able to do wonders on her while she tried to enhance her beauty for the wedding event. And uh, this is something which uh, really can uh, shatter you psychologically. And this is something, uh, if that happens, is going to create a lot of negativity in the marketplace and uh, with you along with your near and dear all are going to talk uh, very much into the disfavor of uh, that particular beautician. So this is uh, a psychological risk which is very high on emotional value and because it is high on emotional value you again have to see to it that uh, this kind of a service is rendered with total perfection with no variability. Another uh, level of risk is uh, the social uh, risk, and this is a risk you know, which presents itself because the service that you have bought may not uh, find approval of uh, the, your near and dear. People who are close to you they may uh, disapprove the service that you have bought, and uh, let us take the example of uh, an event management company that has 
carried out the event of wedding uh, at your place and uh, the company was not in a position to deliver what was expected by you and all those who were there, if it attracts disapproval of uh, all those uh, who are close to you, uh, then uh, it is a great risk. And uh, thinking of that risk, the customer uh, might uh, perceive, it, perceive it as something uh, very consequential and therefore they may not go for uh, this service if you happen to be the seller. So therefore, you again have to look at uh, this particular risk from uh, the customer's standpoint and then see the, what is it that you can do in order to be a better event management company. Is it the variability or is it the inseparability or uh, is it uh, something else, the lack of uh, standardized uh, procedures? I mean, if you do not have the right people, that's a very fundamental kind of example because there is something wrong with human resources. And uh, the, the internal and interactive marketing can have not been uh, very effective. And if um, you have the right people, they're not really motivated to deliver the service uh, very passionately, then again, there is something wrong with uh, the human resources and uh, maybe there is something wrong with the training programs that uh, you did not either carry out very efficiently or uh, you did not carry out at all. So social risk could also be a stumbling block and it might hamper a customer from coming and buying your service. The last the level of risk that I talked about was physical risk. Physical risk is about the danger which the service that you're buying might pose to your body, for example. And I think this can be explained with the help of a medical operation. If you were to go uh, through an operation, you certainly think about certain dangers, and uh, if uh, you know happens uh, to be the situation happens to be uh, like that, then anything you see which uh, makes you prone to that kind of danger is going to keep you from buying that service. It could be something else also, and uh, you have to think of different examples. Could be a construction project uh, in, in which you know you have. Uh, got to take all the precautionary measures in terms of uh, uh, equipment and uh, the training programs of uh, all the employees that are working there and delivering the service uh, where the action is. So uh, there could be so many different examples, but uh, what is important for us all is to understand how a customer thinks or rather evaluates a particular service while he goes through the pre purchase phase or mode. The customer has not yet made up his mind. He is about to make up his mind. He has just started thinking about buying your service and what is it that you should be doing? I think with the help of so many examples and all the uh, building blocks of the knowledge that I referred to uh, at the beginning of this lecture will uh, provide you with the right answers. Let us uh, now move on to the second uh, phase of um, the evaluation process, which is the encounter phase. Encounter phase is a very important phase because this is the phase where the actual service is delivered and uh, where the interaction between the provider and the customer takes place. Before I start talking in detail about this phase, let me tell you that there are four different levels of uh, the encounter phase, the one being interaction, the other being uh, the service environment, and the third being service personnel, and the fourth being the support services. So coming back to interaction, interaction is something which lays the ground for the whole process to get kicked off. In other words, if there is no interaction, there is no encounter. If there is no encounter, there is no buying and selling. So therefore, uh, the interaction uh, is very important from the quality point of view as well. Um, interaction is... Uh, something which takes place at the physical evidence and therefore you also have to have a very convincing physical evidence that is very much in line with the positioning of your product because unless it is like that the customer is going to be kind of put off when he walks into your facility because if he finds colors not in proportion or not in line with what the service is all about he's going to think negatively about that if he finds the furniture they're not really compatible with uh, the kind of service that you are buying, um, again, security, he's going to feel kind of uh, demotivated to buy that service. And let me tell you, 
encounter has not yet taken place. And uh, even when the encounter has taken place, there's no guarantee that the service is going to be bought by the customer. So therefore, physical evidence is the place where the encounter takes place. And you've got to be extremely sensitive to the importance of um, the, the physical evidence that you have created to the sell the, your service. Don't forget, encounter is something uh, which really highlights the concept or uh, the, the very philosophy of uh, the inseparability. Um, it really uh, brings into light uh, the factor of inseparability in such a convincing way that nobody can disagree with the fact that for services, inseparability is the, one of the prime, prime characteristics. So the interaction is very important when it comes to encounters and interaction lays the ground for uh, encounter. And uh, the fact is, the level of interaction defines the level of encounter, meaning the level of quality of encounter. So in other words, interaction should equate quality. Now, this does not automatically mean that this also equates a satisfaction because uh, there are different levels of interaction leading to subsequent levels of quality, leading to subsequent levels of uh, the satisfaction. We can say that uh, the higher the level of interaction, the higher would be the level of encounter. I would like to explain uh, this phenomenon in a moment with the help of uh, a graphic illustration which you will see to your benefit. But uh, just a few words before that, the level of interaction has to be such that uh, customer really finds the encounter with the provider as something very positive. And if he finds that experience positive, only then he will proceed to buy that service. And uh, that automatically defines what level of quality of the encounter has just presented itself. And whether or not it is the level of satisfaction, it is upon the service provider to see. Because uh, he's the person or she's the person who are going to determine for themselves uh, whether the customer is satisfied or not. And the fact of the matter is the promotional side of services uh, really you know, comes into play here. And this is something which you cannot find in tangible goods. And that is because of the inseparability you as a service provider can ask this question directly to your customer whether or not he is kind of satisfied or even if uh, they're not satisfied, you can ask in a certain questions in a subtle way which will lead to a very positive conclusion on your part that at the end of the day, they are going to be satisfied customers and they will come back. So that's the kind of assurance which we as marketing people should generate uh, for ourselves and to ourselves. Another uh, important thing uh, about this uh, level of satisfaction is that you should not be satisfied by a certain level of interaction equating a certain level of encounter and automatically assuming that this is going to be the point of satisfaction. No. Like I said, you've got to determine which is the point of satisfaction. And this is where I would like to show you the presentation. As you can see, there are two axes. We have x-axis and we have y-axis. The x-axis represents interaction and uh, the y-axis is all about encounter, meaning the quality of encounter. And from the coordinates of these two axes uh, emanates a green line, which is the line of satisfaction. And you will see there are different points, A, B, and C on this line. As a matter of fact, you know, the whole thing starts with the letter O, which is uh, also the zero point of uh, the interaction and the level of encounter, and hence the zero level of satisfaction. You can see that there is a corresponding relationship between interaction and uh, the quality of encounter. If you move a little rightwards on the red line, which is x-axis, you will see that you also have a corresponding level of quality of encounter on the y-axis, and they meet at point A on the line of satisfaction. Now, the question here is whether this really should be the point of satisfaction as far as the customer is concerned. Well, again, you have to determine that. Nobody is going to tell you. The customer is the only one who can tell you that. And if you have a way of finding out directly or indirectly, that is something smart on your part. If you move further along the axis, either axis, you know, X and Y, you will see that the next corresponding point on the line of satisfaction is point. B. Now, this is a higher level of interaction and 
a higher level of corresponding encounter. And this automatically means that the level of satisfaction that your customer is deriving at this particular point is higher than the point A. And likewise, point C. I think as marketing people, we've got to strive hard to go for point C, which is the maximum kind of satisfaction or the optimal level of satisfaction which we should be able to provide to our customers. And arguing that we should settle for point A or point B is not going to be very productive because it is the optimal level of satisfaction which we should try to create and generate in order to be effective marketing people. So we have seen that uh, there is a corresponding relationship between the level of interaction and the level of encounter. And the level of encounter defines the level of quality of encounter. This is a very important uh, relationship that uh, we have to keep in mind. But then this is not the only conclusion that we should draw from this illustration. There has to be another conclusion uh, that drawn out of this uh, exercise. And that is the fact that encounters can be full of variability. And it is because of that that you see different levels of uh, the satisfaction at the line of satisfaction, which is green in nature. So how do we take care of this variability? We are back to the characteristic of variability. And uh, it is at the time of encounter that we've got to see to it that variability does not present itself. So to diminish the chances of variability, service providers seek support of technology. And it is because of this factor that you see these automatic teller machines. It is because of this that you have very modern, sophisticated telephone exchanges. And it is because of this that uh, you have so many other kinds of uh, technological supports to different kinds of services. The idea here is to lessen the variability when it comes to encounter in order to make sure that variability does not creep in. In other words, you can say that uh, when it comes to voluminous jobs, which are very repetitive, and which are extremely routine oriented, day in, day out, over in, over out, and second in, second out. The fact remains that uh, these services can be supported with the help of technology that I've just talked about. And um, it is with the help of that technology that variability uh, is lessened. Although there is an element of, uh, of, of machines and uh, the technical features which uh, many of the customers find rather inhuman because uh, when you encounter with machines instead of humans the machines cannot uh, respond to your emotions and uh, that is where some customers feel that uh, there's a constraint on part of the providers when it comes to providing the service but nevertheless uh, the technology support here is uh, very productive and without such support we couldn't have been where we are today in terms of uh, the facilitation of these kinds of services. Now, it is all very well with taking care of variability when it comes to managing services which are very high on um, routines and systems and procedures and for which you, know, you can define very well spelled out uh, standard operating uh, procedures. But what about those services where these machines cannot play an important role or cannot play a role at all and we keep talking about services uh, being very sensitive because of the human factor. And the fact is that uh, we have talked about the additional three Ps, testifying what I'm talking about, that uh, the services have to be taken in a very different light. And uh, it is the quality aspect of uh, the services. Also concerned about the human factor which is involved. And we know humans cannot be very consistent. The element of variability is going to pro present itself, come what may. So we must ensure in one way or the other that the quality of service or the encounter which is taking place is full of quality and the quality of service is not compromised. There are uh, a few factors that determine the level of quality of interaction and uh, the certain ways and means which can come to your rescue when it comes to making sure that um, the variability uh, does not really negatively affect it do, well it always negatively affect but uh, the negative effect of variability is minimized that's a challenge for the marketing people there are uh, two different theories uh, which uh, are propounded by different uh, the marketing experts and those theories lay the ground for marketing people to be very 
uh, responsive to the kind of variability I'm talking about and for the services which are not high on routines. One is role theory and the other is script theory. Role theory dictates that uh, both the seller and the buyer have got to be very clear about their roles. So in other words, what this theory talks about is it is not only the seller every time who's got to play his role, it also is the buyer who's got to play his role as well in order to be effective and productive. Because if he's effective and productive, he's going to be a loyal customer and then he's going to come back to you. And that's the name of the game in services marketing and of course in other marketing as well. But the role is very important. Playing of roles by the provider and by the buyer as well. Now, the role of the buyer cannot be thrusted upon him, you see, because you can only influence that role. You cannot hold your customer by force that this is the role that you've got to play. Uh, no, it's not like that. The beauty of the role playing is that the provider plays his role in a way that the customer automatically ends up playing his role very effectively. And um, this is uh, all about the role theory. In order to substantiate what I've talked about, let me give you a couple of examples about the role which um, the customers could end up playing and hence uh, they become uh, loyal customers to that particular organization. Let's talk about the marketing research services which you are buying as a professional. Now, until the time that you happen to be a good professional by yourself and know the role that you are supposed to be playing, you cannot effectively buy that particular service. Because until the time you are clear about the hypothesis of the research design and the possible results with which the design is going to bring to you, uh, without, of course, any level of bias into it, you cannot be an effective customer. So therefore, this is a role which you've got to play, and uh, the provider, in any case, is clear about or should be clear about his role as well. And it is the marriage of these roles that uh, makes the encounter very productive and effective. The second example could be about that customer who goes to an architect or, again, to a, a company of management consultants making his valuable contributions and, therefore, making the encounter very healthy and productive. The level of encounter or the quality of encounter can be very different for this customer or another customer who is not in a position to make this kind of positive contribution while he is into an encounter with the same architect or with the same management consultant. So you can see that uh, different kinds of customers, by playing their roles effectively or less effectively or ineffectively, uh, can bring out either the best out of uh, the service providers or not the best out of uh, the service providers. You, as a customer, might lead with your service provider to come up with his worst. I mean, that's the worst possible scenario. And uh, therefore, role-playing on part of the customer becomes very important. Another example could be about a patient you know, who's smart and who comes up with uh, complete details of uh, his medical history and thus making it very easy for the doctor to diagnose you know, his ailment and uh, then giving a service which is absolutely world-class. So you will recall that uh, what I would have talked about by way of examples also has a lot to do with the classification of services, in particular the nature of service. And uh, whether it is a consultancy company or a group of architects or uh, a group of um, doctors, you've got to see to it that uh, the structure that you have for your organization, small or big, has got to be woven around the purpose that you offer to your customers. If you stick to that and revolve around that, you have to you have to have the right vision and the mission for the service or for the company that you're working for, and uh, you, you are bound to move into the right strategic direction. Otherwise, there's going to be derailment of uh, the, the, company, uh, the company's objectives and uh, hence an unfavorable situation for the company. An effective role-playing by the customer is uh, extremely important, as you've seen with the help of these examples. And uh, we shall uh, now get on to the next theory, which is about the script. And this is known as uh, script theory. Well, a script is basically the written copy of the text of a play, a film, or uh, broadcasting. That basically is a script. 
And uh, this theory basically is an extension of uh, the role theory. Uh, the only difference is that uh, the providers have got to be extremely clear about this script that they have to play. And at the same time, it's very important, at the same time, they've got to see to it that they also create scripts for their customers. I mean, you cannot expect your customers to come to your service scape with scripts ready and then follow those scripts, you know, point by point. You've got to create script for the customer and then enable that customer to play his role effectively so that the customer develops certain positive experiences and services being very rich on, on the experience side uh, dictate that uh, the encounter has got to be positive and uh, this is one of the best ways to make sure that the encounter remains positive because you have created the script not only for yourself but also for your customer. And the beauty of uh, the creation of this script is that uh, you follow your script and uh, the customer follows his or her. And the pivotal role again is uh, the going to be played by the provider who prepares the script. Now, how does he prepare the script and uh, how is it that uh, this script gets uh, translated into the very uniform and consistent kind of actions on part of the provider so that the quality of encounter does not get affected? This is a very interesting point and I will bring you back to the uh, importance of laying down standard operating procedures. It basically is the SOPs which form the ground for an effective script. And by following that script, day in and day out, and over in and over out, what is happening is that you as a provider develop a certain behavior which makes you move, coordinate, and act in the same manner every time that you provide that service to your customers. That's the beauty of the script. And therefore, the need for maintaining the standardized operating procedures. Now, when you do that, you also have to make sure that the script for the customer that you have prepared also gets translated uh, very effectively into actions which are favorable to the customer himself and also to the company. Now, how do you do that? In order to do that so that the customer ends up as a productive customer, there are certain ways and means which you bring into play and there's no rocket science about it. Some simple logic behind this concept. An example, it must be part of the script to guide the first time visitors to an international chain of fast food restaurants in a new town. A fast food restaurant has just penetrated a new market. It happens to be a small market and uh, the people there are not really exposed to the concept of uh, the self-service and therefore it has to be part of the script of the provider to guide their uh, customers into the buying that particular service the meaning they have to be guided into the placement of the order they have to be told how to proceed and uh, the place the order make the payment and then about the subsequent seating and so on and so forth so uh, if you have uh, as a provider uh, played uh, the, your role the, by following this particular script in this particular way you have ended up having a productive customer the, because the customer automatically has followed his script and you facilitated the customer into playing his uh, script and this is the essence of uh, the script theory another example uh, of this particular concept is uh, the busy international airports where you see signage uh, and complete and comprehensive details for the travelers to follow those details and uh, the instructions which uh, are to be followed at an international airport. So uh, what is happening is that uh, the management of the airport being the service providers have uh, made it very clear for people to follow the script they are supposed to be following. Now just imagine if uh, this management does not uh, put up uh, the very effective signage uh, which is about uh, the maintaining queues and certain aisles and uh, the following different steps in terms of embarkation or disembarkation, so to say, what is going to happen? It is going to be a chaotic situation and uh, the, this chaotic situation the, might uh, occur only because the scripts um, on either side uh, have not been followed. Either the, the management of the airport has not been very diligent enough in uh, following their um, script 
uh, which generally is not the case. Uh, and in most uh, the probability, it is the uh, script which uh, had to be followed by the passengers as customers, which was not followed. And therefore, um, the chaos which you see at the airport is uh, self-explanatory. It is the result, a direct consequence of the absence of a very uh, well spelled out script. So script theory is all about uh, providers having their script and providers also uh, having developed the script for their customers and then facilitating their customers into following their script so that they can play the role effectively and efficiently. And don't forget that effective and efficient customer is a loyal customer and a loyal customer is the one who's going to come back and give you a continuous stream of revenues. And that is what the whole game is all about. A routine can change due to any set of given circumstances. And whenever there's a change in routines, the scripts have got to be changed accordingly. And uh, it necessitates on your part as providers to bring about a corresponding change in your standard operating procedures and then practice those, rehearse those, so that you do not make any mistakes as providers and also ensure that uh, no mistakes or no unnecessary bottlenecks are created while your customers are uh, playing um, their role following their script. I'll be talking about uh, other aspects of Encounter in the next lecture and to recap what uh, I've talked about uh, during this lecture um, is uh, the pre-purchase process which um, is the foundation stone for uh, things to come in services and uh, we have to be very mindful of uh, the thought process on part of the customer as to how they think while they are considering buying a particular service and um, different mechanisms and different uh, steps, features and elements that I've talked about are to be considered very seriously while we go through that process because we've got to put on the thinking gap of the customer and then see as to how we can respond to uh, those thoughts in a strategic and technical way. More on this in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your presence, and I look forward to talking with you next time. Allah Hafiz.